It was a chilling morning on January 3rd, 1991, when Seaside City Police arrived at Sabado Park, California. The sun had barely risen when they stumbled upon the lifeless body of 34-year-old Vicki Johnson, sprawled across the sandy playground. Vicki had met a ghastly end right in the center of the park. Her brutalized body bore the tormenting signs of a monstrous mutilation. She had been suffocated and strangled, her airways blocked with a significant amount of sand. The culprit had left bite marks all along her body, evidence of the unspeakable cruelty inflicted upon her. Her clothes were torn, and the upper part of her torso and part of her clothing had been set on fire. The scene painted a haunting picture of a woman subjected to unimaginable torment, her life cruelly snuffed out in a manner that defied comprehension. The brutality of the attack left investigators horrified and the community gripped by shock and fear. Seaside City, California had earned an ugly reputation as a hostile community in the 90s gripped by the overwhelming wave of an illegal substance epidemic, drowning in crime up until the early 2000s. This particular case only magnified the town's unfriendly reputation. Amidst the out-of-control gang violence, this incident stood out of the ordinary. Vicki Johnson, unlike many others affected by the fighting, had no ties to any gangs. Vicki Johnson's body was discovered lying openly in the park, frequented by many. The culprit did not bother to hide the body in any way. Yet no one had called the authorities, no witnesses had come forward. The silence surrounding the crime scene highlighted the chilling culture of fear that pervaded the community. Calling the police seemed like an overwhelming act of courage for a witness back then. Despite the overwhelming wounds and pain, Vicki Johnson had valiantly fought for her life. Her skin beneath her fingernails was full of blood. Not her blood, but that of the perpetrator. Detectives, recognizing the potential evidence, collected her fingernail clippings in the hopes of uncovering vital clues. A substantial amount of foreign DNA was discovered beneath her nails but running it through the criminal database of the 90s, no match was found. Leads were scarce and justice seemed elusive. For over 32 agonizing years, the case faded away in the cold shadows of uncertainty. However, a glimmer of hope emerged in 2021 when the skin from under Vicki Johnson's fingernails underwent DNA testing at the California Department of Justice. The path to justice proved incredibly slow. There were systemic challenges of backlogs and inadequate staffing within the forensic system, a frustrating reality associated with handling cold cases. However, two years later in 2023, the Justice Crime Laboratory made a crucial discovery, a DNA match linked to a man named Frank Lewis McClure. He is a former convict whose profile was logged into the CODIS National Database. The relation of this DNA match breathed a new life into the case. While McClure's DNA linked him to the crime scene, the motive behind Vicky's demise remained a mystery. McClure's history, however, told a chilling story of violence. Frank Lewis McClure's criminal record traces back to 1990, involving crimes such as causing severe bodily harm and resisting police. This history continued in 1994 when the suspect breached probation by committing battery with a fatal weapon and engaging in domestic fighting, resulting in a four-year prison sentence. During the same year as the incident, in 1991, McClure was involved in battering with a fatal weapon and domestic fighting. 
Specifically, instances of domestic fighting comprised the most frequent charges against him. Occurring in 1990, the aforementioned 1991 case, the 1994 case, then another case in 1999, and most recently in 2011. The nature of his relationship with Vicki Johnson remained unclear, leaving a critical piece of the puzzle unresolved. The reason for the connection between the two would remain a mystery, because McClure passed away of natural causes in 2021 at the age of 77. His passing meant he would never face accountability for the crime. Police believed he passed away peacefully in his seaside residence, evading the consequences altogether. The DNA technology in question is not new. This testing could have been done 10 years ago, and he could have been apprehended alive. By the time the law caught up to him, he had already passed away. Frank Lewis McClure hailed from a prominent family in the community. He, however, was not celebrated for his character. His connection to the crime struck a chord of surprise among seaside residents. Mark Vaughn, a long-standing resident of Seaside, voiced the collective sentiment of shock and sorrow. Vaughn, who had known Vicky from their school days at Fremont Junior High, reminisced about her kind nature and the once beautiful aura of her family. In her final years, Vicky grappled with addiction, a heart-rending struggle that added complexity to her story. There is a strong likelihood that Vicki Johnson and McClure might have known each other. Their primary connection seems to revolve around their involvement in illicit substances activities. The situation is particularly challenging since the suspect is deceased, leaving us with uncertainties about the full extent of their connection. The investigation continues, leaving the door open for someone close to McClure to provide crucial information. There remains a hope that someone McClure confided in about his actions might come forward and share the truth with law enforcement. Seaside police issued a plea to the community, urging anyone with information about unsolved cold cases in the area to come forward. They implore individuals to reach out to the department at 831-899-6748. Solving cold cases is not merely about closure. It is a crucial step in preventing future tragedies. By solving these cases, the local police create a formidable deterrent. Potential suspects are bound to think again about their actions if they realize that the local law enforcement agencies have a history of successfully solving even old crimes. Vicki Johnson's legacy endures through her three sons, the youngest being former NBA player Orlando Johnson. He was just a year old when his mother was taken away from them. We hope that this pivotal discovery will grant her family the closure they have yearned for. On October 7th, 1992, young Nikki Allen walked home from her grandpa's apartment. It was around 8.30 in the evening. When her mother, Sharon Henderson, got home, Nikki Allen was gone. She could not be found anywhere. Over a hundred neighbors came together to look for her. Nikki, a seven-year-old girl who lived with her family in West Garth, Sunderland, England, was missing. After a day's search, they discovered Nikki's red shoes and purple coat outside an old abandoned exchange building near her apartment. The search party decided to comb through the derelict building. Soon after, a teenager rushed out of the building in a state of panic. He discovered a body inside. It was Nikki Allen, found inside the exchange building's basement. 
She had suffered 37 stab wounds and her head was brutally hit with a brick. The Northumbria police thoroughly traced Nikki's path from her grandpa's apartment to her home, combing the streets for evidence. They found an eyewitness who had been at the Boar's Head pub on that crucial night. While playing dominoes and having a beer, this witness saw Nikki walking alongside a man in a white shirt. It seemed she knew him, joyfully skipping to catch up with him. The unexpected tragedy deeply affected everyone in West Garth, including police officers who were accustomed to difficult circumstances. There was a large turnout at Nikki Allen's funeral, and the funeral procession was lengthy and heart-wrenching. Following the burial, the quest to find Nikki's attacker continued. An artist's rendering of the man in the white shirt became a crucial aspect of the investigation. Numerous officers were dedicated to the case. The detectives conducted door-to-door -door inquiries in West Garth to gather leads and seek potential eyewitnesses. Despite the community's familiarity with Nikki, there were no eyewitnesses except for one neighbor. This individual informed the detectives that he knew Nikki and had seen her that night too. He recalled being at the old exchange building a few days earlier with a young boy searching for pigeons. The police fixated their efforts on finding the man in the white shirt, but they were unable to find any leads for almost a year. Then, in late 1993, George Heron, a young man residing near Nikki Allen's home, was arrested on the suspicion of taking her life. A knife matching the stab wounds was discovered in Heron's home. Blood spatters were also found on his shoes and clothing. Heron's sister informed the police that on the night of the incident, he had an unusual half hour in the bathroom, which was out of character for him. It appears he was washing himself and his clothes. Initially denying being out that evening, four witnesses claimed they saw a man resembling Heron at local pubs where he was seen buying Nicky Allen's favorite, cheese and onion crisps, which police believed he used to entice Nicky into the building. George Heron repeatedly denied any involvement in Nicky's demise over 120 times during questioning. However, as pressure mounted on him, he gradually started making partial admissions. What stood out as particularly shocking was the method by which the police guided him to provide an account that aligned with what they needed to hear. They dropped clues and essentially manipulated him into describing the events in a manner they already knew. There were evident aspects Heron did not know about. Yet the police steered him toward those details. After three days of questioning, the police got Heron's confession. Although the evidence against Heron was largely circumstantial, the police were confident in securing a conviction. However, the handling of George Heron became notorious as a significant low point in Northumbria police operations. The case against Heron fell apart when the judge deemed his taped confession inadmissible in court, citing heavy-handed police tactics. Due to this ruling, Heron was found not guilty. He was granted a change of identity and relocated away from Sunderland, England. In 1994, Sharon Henderson, the heartbroken mother, initiated a civil lawsuit against Heron accusing him of battery on a child, resulting in her demise. Surprisingly, the court ruled in her favor and instructed Heron to pay her over £7,000. But since Heron's identity and location were changed, he could not be found, leading to the money never being paid. Encountering initial setbacks, the Northumbria police felt embarrassed and reluctant to prosecute anyone without substantial evidence. With this mindset, no additional leads surfaced and the case went cold for 21 years. In February 2014, cold case detectives revisited the case upon discovering resemblance to the crimes committed 
by Stephen John Greveson, a serial offender already behind bars. Known as the Sunderland Strangler, Greveson was convicted of strangling four teenage boys in a series of bloodbaths between 1990 and 1994 in Sunderland, England. Even though Nikki Allen was a girl and her cause of demise involved stabbing, the severe blunt force trauma to her head resembled injuries inflicted by Greveson on his victim, Simon Martin, in 1990. Greveson was questioned regarding potential involvement, but detectives later confirmed he would not face immediate action in connection to their ongoing investigation. The Nikki Allen case went cold again for two more years. Then, in May 2016, Nikki's mother, Sharon Henderson, demanded a comprehensive reinvestigation of the crime. She initiated an online petition urging Northumbria police to conduct a thorough review of the case. Within less than 24 hours, the petition garnered over 500 signatures. Then, in April 2017, Henderson met with Northumbria Police Chief Constable Steve Ashman and Detective Chief Inspector Lisa Theaker. They reaffirmed their commitment to bring Nikki's culprit to justice. By October 2017, the police finally got a breakthrough. They recovered a DNA sample of an unidentified male from Nikki's clothing. They ran the DNA through their criminal record, but it took them eight months to find a match. On April 7, 2018, Northumbria police conducted a raid on a house located in the Stockton area of Teesside. They arrested a man suspected of Nikki's slaying. The police built their case for four years before bringing forward the charges against the suspect arrested in 2018. On May 24, 2022, the suspect, identified as 54-year-old David Thomas Boyd, appeared at Newcastle Crown Court. Then, on June 20, 2022, Boyd pled not guilty. Before proceeding with Boyd's trial, the police needed to rectify their slip-up from 28 years ago. In May 2023, Northumbria police apologized to George Heron for bringing forward the civil lawsuit of £7,000 in 1994. On April 20, 2023, Boyd's trial commenced at Newcastle Crown Court. The prosecution alleged that Boyd lured Nicky Allen to a wasteland near the River Ware. Witnesses mentioned seeing Nikki skipping to catch up with a man, but they never saw her abduction. According to the prosecution, Boyd lured Nikki through a boarded-up window of the old exchange building. There, he brutally hit her with a brick, causing severe head injuries, and then inflicted multiple stab wounds to her chest, heart, and lungs. The post-mortem examination revealed she had experienced blunt force trauma to her head, likely rendering her unconscious before the stabbing. A witness recalled hearing a loud scream around 10 p.m., pinpointing the timing of the attack. Nikki's body was discovered the following day in the building's basement by volunteers aiding in the search for her. During the trial, it was revealed that at the time of Nikki's demise, Boyd went by the name David Smith or David Bell and was 25 years old. The case relied on circumstantial evidence, but was described as compelling given Boyd's DNA found on Nikki's clothing. Boyd suggested to the police that Nikki might have transferred his DNA by wiping her hands on his saliva which he claimed had accidentally landed on her clothes after he spat from his balcony that night. Additionally, it was reported that Boyd was familiar with the old exchange building's layout and had previously used the same window a few days earlier when he took a boy there to search for pigeons. Yes, 
David Boyd is the same neighbor who told the detectives 30 years ago that he knew Nikki Allen. He saw Nikki that night. He even admitted back then he had gone to the exchange building a few days before with a boy. But the police were fixated on finding the man in the white shirt, and they never followed up on him. It turns out that back in those days, David Boyd's girlfriend used to babysit Nikki Allen. More surprisingly, David Boyd's past included child violation convictions that surfaced during the trial. In March 2000, he was convicted of indecently assaulting a young girl at a park in Stockton, an incident that occurred on April 8, 1999. Additionally, in 1986, Boyd was convicted of breaching the peace for approaching four children in Sacriston County, Durham, and grabbing a 10-year-old girl. 30 years ago, police completely ignored the connection of a known abuser with Nikki Allen. During the trial, the defense argued that the various pieces of evidence presented did not completely prove Boyd's guilt in this case and suggested that these were merely coincidences. Mrs. Justice Christina Lambert informed the jury that the case relied on circumstantial evidence and emphasized the absence of direct evidence pointing to Boyd's guilt. As the trial progressed, it was reported that Boyd opted not to testify or provide evidence in his defense. On May 12, 2023, Boyd was declared guilty of Nikki's demise after a jury comprising 10 women and two men deliberated for two and a half hours before reaching a verdict. On May 23, 2023, Boyd received a life sentence with a minimum term of 29 years before he could be considered for parole. His eligibility for parole will commence on August 16, 2049. Boyd intends to appeal both his conviction and the sentence handed down to him. In August 2023, Sharon Henderson intended to file a lawsuit against Northumbria Police due to the extensive 30-year duration it took to find the culprit. Following this, in September 2023, news surfaced regarding a review of the police investigation that spanned 30 years. This review was scheduled to be conducted by either the Independent Office for Police Conduct, IOPC, or another police force. In the Nikki Allen case, the police had a difficult case with very little evidence. However, they failed Sharon and Nikki profoundly from the start and continuously over the years. Despite having an ideal suspect, they repeatedly missed identifying him. Ultimately, what shifted the course was the advancements in forensics and DNA technology. They finally pinpointed DNA on Nikki's body, unequivocally linking it to David Boyd. Shelly Ann Warner, just 15 years old, lived with her mother, Kathleen Warner, in Mishawaka, Indiana. She was a student at Mishawaka High School, active in sports and part of the school band. On June 16, 1980, she bid farewell to her mother, heading to Wilt Supermarket in her 1973 orange Volkswagen, a mere two miles away. But as the day waned, she did not return home. Her mother got worried and contacted the police. Initially, the authorities thought she might be a runaway, a missing person. But as the clock ticked past 24 hours, the case took a chilling turn. The investigators shifted gears, labeling the case as a possible abduction. Police rushed to Wilt Supermarket, interrogating employees who distinctly remembered Shelly Ann purchasing groceries around 1.30 p.m. the day before. Eyewitness accounts painted an unsettling scene of Shelly Ann's disappearance from the store. Witnesses vividly remembered seeing Shelly Ann leaving the store around 2 p.m., heading towards her car parked a mere 50 feet from the entrance. However, 
an unsettling occurrence transpired. A man approached her vehicle, swiftly pulling open the driver's side door while Shelly Ann was in the driver's seat. Witnesses remembered her expression, surprised, almost alarmed. The man brashly got into the driver's seat, causing Shelly Ann to shift to the passenger side. Unfortunately, with his back turned, the witnesses could not tell if he was holding a weapon or not. The orange Volkswagen Beetle drove off, heading east on Lincoln Way. And just like that, Shelley Ann Warner vanished into the unknown, leaving behind a perplexed community and investigators scrambling to unravel the unsettling sequence of events. Eyewitnesses recalled the man as possibly aged between 16 and 18, standing at about 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighing around 130 pounds. Witnesses offered a detailed portrait of the man, describing his unique features, medium-length blonde hair and a matching blonde mustache, making him stand out in a crowd. Before the abduction, the man had been observed lingering around the store, raising suspicion about his intentions. The store employees speculated that the man might have hitchhiked to the store or been dropped off by a friend. Mitch Iana, Crime Stoppers, and law enforcement diligently reconstructed the scene, releasing a suspect sketch in hopes of generating leads. Despite numerous tips, none provided the crucial breakthrough investigators desperately wanted. A few days later, Shelly Ann's car was found at a park and shop store in Osceola, Indiana. Oddly, there were no signs of struggle within the vehicle. Investigators deduced that the perpetrator might have abandoned the car there to evade capture and continue his sinister activities. The relentless search for answers continued, but each twist and turn only deepened the haunting mystery surrounding the disappearance of Shelley Ann Warner. A massive search operation unfolded, involving helicopters, volunteers, and search dogs scouring every inch of the area. Despite the exhaustive efforts, the search yielded no trace of the missing 15-year-old. Ten agonizing days later, two girls walking through a wooded area stumbled upon a grim and heartbreaking sight. They found a decomposing body near abandoned train tracks on Madison Road, roughly three miles south of South Bend. Tragically, it was confirmed that the lifeless body belonged to the missing teenager, Shelley Ann Warner. Her body lay partially clothed, discarded in a ravine. The forensic examination revealed a horrifying truth. Shelly Ann had been mercilessly shot twice at close range. One devastating shot had pierced her head and another had ravaged her body. The news of this heinous crime that had claimed the life of a vibrant young girl shattered any remaining hope for her mother, Kathleen Warner. Autopsy findings suggested that Shelly Ann's body had been discarded roughly seven to ten days before its tragic discovery. Despite the advanced state of decomposition, law enforcement suspected the atrocious nature of the crime might have been motivated by the desire to intimately assault her. Police tirelessly pursued numerous leads and interrogated several suspects. They explored unconventional methods, even resorting to hypnosis to extract additional details regarding the abduction and untimely demise of Shelley Ann Warner. However, these efforts bore no substantial breakthroughs, and the case eventually went cold. Decades later, a hesitant witness finally stepped forward, driven by a sense of responsibility and the courage to break their silence. This person identified three individuals linked to Shelley Ann's case. Detectives revealed that the witness, initially fearful of vengeance against their family, found the courage to speak up only after two of the suspects had passed away. Although two suspects had already passed away and the third had vanished over time, 
This newfound information reignited hope for justice. Detectives, fueled by this lead, made the decision to reopen the case, determined to pursue justice for Shelley Ann Warner, bringing a glimmer of hope to a case long shrouded in darkness. As the investigation progressed, investigators unearthed additional witnesses and a trove of new evidence that substantially supported the witnesses' initial statement. This mounting evidence bolstered the case, strengthening its credibility. During the course of their inquiries, investigators made a startling discovery. The third suspect, who had previously vanished, was confirmed deceased as of 2018. Two other suspects had also passed away, one in 2001 and another in 2010. Dave Dossman, a member of the cold case unit, emphasized how the passing of the suspects prompted an important witness to come forward and reveal crucial information. In 2023, after meticulous analysis of gathered evidence and statements, the St. Joseph County Prosecutor's Office deemed the proof against the three suspects conclusive. However, due to all three suspects' demise, authorities were unable to pursue criminal charges against them. The names of the suspects were never disclosed as charges could not be filed. With the investigation closed, law enforcement officials disclosed that the assault on Warner was not a random act. Despite her lack of close ties to the suspects, there existed some degree of familiarity between Shelley Ann Warner and certain family members of the suspects. Dossman's revelation echoed a painful truth. Shelley Ann Warner knew the suspects, a connection that was not immediately apparent. She would have known who these suspects were, and vice versa, Dossman emphasized, shedding light on the relationship. Reflecting on the prolonged investigation, the lead detective divulged the grim reality behind the delays. Fear and threats exerted by the suspects against potential witnesses paralyzed the progress. Not only did they intimidate the witnesses, but also their families. Despite the offenders never facing the scales of justice, the case was reluctantly closed after an agonizing 43 years. Even the passage of time has brought no closure to the family. Shelley Ann's parents passed away, leaving her sister as the remaining link to a past marred by tragedy. While her sister found some comfort in the case finally wrapping up, the absence of identifiable DNA on evidence sent to the lab and the unresolved justice served as a haunting reminder of what could never be reclaimed. Today, Shelley Ann Warner would have turned 58 had the precious life not been taken away so brutally. This tragic story ends without the closure of justice, leaving behind a legacy marked by unanswered questions and a longing for what could have been. Nellie Hicks was a 59-year-old mother of six children. She was a fourth grade teacher at Ashland School in San Lorenzo, California. On May 10, 1972, Nellie was at her home in Newark, California. She lived with her adult son and his wife, as well as her longtime friend. Nellie's friend, also a teacher, briefly spoke with her around 1 a.m. that fateful morning. She was dozing off on a living room sofa. It was the last time she was seen alive. About four hours later, Nellie's son discovered her lifeless body in the same room. Her wallet was missing. It was later found a few blocks away, next to a pair of blood-stained underwear. The other occupants were all asleep as the slaying unfolded. That led police to suspect that the intruder knocked her unconscious before assaulting her. Her body was partially naked, and police determined that she had been assaulted and bludgeoned with a brick wrapped in pantyhose. The brutality was immediately apparent. 
with her head split open by the force of the blows. The perpetrator entered the home through an unlocked sliding glass door and used manicure scissors to cut her dress and bra. Nellie was a well-liked, respected teacher, so everyone who knew her could not think that someone would have a motive to take her life. A decade before she left an abusive husband, he and other men she dated were interrogated, but it did not lead to finding a possible suspect. Fingerprints were recovered, but it was never tied to a specific person. DNA was collected at the autopsy. However, as DNA technology did not exist at the time, the case went cold despite decades of investigation. Soon, another horrendous crime would take place in the area. Teresa Pica was 48 years old and stayed on Edlow Drive in Hayward, California. On May 15, 1979, one of Teresa's twin 10-year-old daughters discovered her, slumped over her couch, face down. She was last seen alive the night before by her three children. Her nightgown had been pulled up, exposing her legs. Her hands were bound behind her back with a rope. A blood-stained rock was found next to her and a shirt that had been used to gag her. A front room window had been pried open. The only witness account of an intruder came from a neighbor who heard rustling near the home in the middle of the night. Teresa's purse was missing. Her wallet and other contents were later discovered in a neighbor's yard and in a garbage can down the street. As with Nellie's case, DNA was collected, but no technology existed to test it. Several people were investigated in the ensuing decades, but no suspects emerged. Two very similar cases, both women were found by family members who woke up in the morning to discover their loved ones' bodies bludgeoned and assaulted. An intruder had quietly entered their homes and attacked them as they slept in their living rooms. In 2023, investigators from the Hayward and Newark Police Departments consulted with the FBI and contracted Othram and Astria Forensics to reevaluate the DNA. That led to Fred Bernard Farnham being identified as the offender. Hayward and Newark Police announced in December 2023 that Farnham was responsible for the slayings of Nellie Ann Hicks in 1972 in Newark and Teresa Pica in Hayward in 1979. Farnham, frustratingly, passed away at the age of 73 in a hospital in Oregon in 2007. He grew up in Central Valley, California, and then moved to the South Bay in the 1950s. There, he was convicted for multiple assaults in the 1970s. There is no indication he ever lived in the East Bay. He also lived in Nevada, Idaho, North Dakota, Alaska, and Oregon, where he lost his life in the town of Cape Junction. The remains of one potential suspect, identified through the same process that found Farnham, were exhumed in 2021. It was later excluded through DNA comparison to the crime scene evidence. That man, however, was on the same genealogical tree, police said. David Hicks, the youngest of Nellie's six children and one of three still alive, thanked authorities who persisted to find closure in the 52-year-old cold case. Her son, Ron, who found her body, passed away three months prior to the police solving Nellie's cold case. David called his mother a hero who raised a family of six and worked full-time as a teacher. I cannot express my gratitude enough for the police department and their dedication to this case. All of them worked extremely hard to bring closure to our family. In a statement read aloud at the news conference, 
Teresa's daughters similarly voiced relief at the resolution provided by Farnham's identification. Our mother may now rest peacefully, the statement reads. We have accepted the fact that whoever did this would never come to justice. Nevertheless, we thank God for your diligence and for never giving up. We can now move forward and close this painful chapter in our lives. Teresa's daughter, Jan Whelan, 62, told the San Francisco Chronicle that while it was a good thing to learn the suspect's identity after all these years, it also triggered everything again. For most of my life, I blamed myself because I was not able to stop what happened. And just a few years ago, I was able to finally tell myself that there was nothing I could do. But it still hurts. Now this will help bring me closure. Newark Police Captain Jolie Macias said after Teresa was slain, Newark and Hayward Police linked the crimes because of the discernible pattern of behavior shared by the two cases. This drove the belief that figuring out one case would solve the other. She also made a point to reciprocate the sentiments from the victim survivors by saying, Today is truly about these families and their resiliency for the past 50-plus years. Hayward Police Chief Brian Matthews said at the news conference that 45 years is a long time. It has been a long time for generations of investigators who have worked on this case, and it has been a long time for the families of the victims and our community as they have waited for answers. Officials suspect that Farnham could have been involved in other cases as well and have alerted law enforcement to look at their other cold cases for possible connections. Anyone with information about criminal cases that could have connections to Farnham can contact Haywood Police Detective Rob Purnell at 510-293-7171 On December 6, 1975, in a field off 100th Avenue and Lowell Boulevard in Westminster, Colorado, a woman's lifeless body was found. She was found by two people riding their motorcycles. Her clothing and personal items were also found at the scene, so she could be identified as Terry Becker. She was 20 years old at the time. Terry grew up in Casper, Wyoming, and moved to the Denver metropolitan area after graduating from high school. Terry was described as a free spirit by her friends and family. She lived life on the edge. Terry enjoyed painting and listening to music. Her favorite bands were Three Dog Night and Steppenwolf. An autopsy was done, and it showed that she was assaulted and strangled. Terry had last been seen two days prior when she hitchhiked to visit her boyfriend at the Adams County Detention Center in Brighton, Colorado. Chandra Thurston, senior criminalist with the Westminster Police Department, who was the lead detective on the case, said she had just been dumped there in the field. Officers respond, an investigation begins, and then over time, you know, suspects are looked at and nothing develops. The case went cold. In 1991, a similar crime took place. Sherry Bridgewater was assaulted and slain in her apartment on the 1000 block of West Monroe Avenue near Owens and H Street in Las Vegas, Nevada. She was a 31-year-old mother of two boys and was found by two women, a friend and a relative. The investigation team worked the case relentlessly over the years to solve it, but unfortunately, the case went cold. In 2003, 12 years later, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation was able to extract DNA from a piece of evidence from Terry's case. The sample of an unknown male was uploaded to the CODIS Combined DNA Index System database but no match was found. Ten years later, in 2013, 
the Las Vegas Metro Police Department entered DNA into their database from Sherry's perpetrator. The sample matched with Terry's perpetrator, so the two cases were connected. Before the DNA breakthrough, both cases were without a suspect. In 2019, technology and genetic genealogy pointed to a possible man. Thomas Martin Elliott, a veteran with an extensive criminal history. He was in prison for committing a burglary in Lakewood, Colorado, and was sentenced to six years in prison. He was released in 1981, and then he committed a serious offense against a 13-year-old girl in Carson City, Nevada. He was sent to prison on a life sentence, but with the option of parole. He got out 10 years later and then became the primary suspect in the cold case in Las Vegas. Five months later, on October 30, 1991, he took his own life by shooting himself. He was 40 years old. He was buried in the Southern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery due to the short enlistment he had with the military. The Las Vegas police did not have the resources to further investigate Elliot as a possible suspect. In October 2023, after seeking assistance from the Vegas Justice League, an organization who has helped the department solve several cold cases, they were able to receive funding from them, allowing police to exhume Elliot's body for a DNA sample. In 2024, it was confirmed. It was a match for both Terry and Sherry's cases. One challenge in identifying and linking the DNA was the fact that Elliot was adopted by his mother's second husband. His birth mother, Nancy West, had divorced his biological father later to remarry. Elliot's connection to Terry was not known, but the police found out that he and Sherry attended the same Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Chandra Thurston, senior criminalist with the Westminster Police Department, said it was almost a huge relief to finally say someone's name did this to Terry. There were definitely times during this where you felt, I am never going to figure this out. We are never going to figure this out. There is a lot of relief, and I hope that she knows we did not give up on her and we worked until we were able to find justice. Even if it is this way, without being able to prosecute someone, to find justice for her and to know that she mattered and that we always cared about her. A.C. Stutson, commander in investigations with Westminster Police said, there has been a lot of ups and downs in this case. We were so close many times and it would slip away David Becker, Terry's brother, is her only living relative. He lives in Texas and said the following, I cannot say enough how grateful I am. I just really applaud the Westminster Police Department. It is hard to believe after 45 years, the DNA can match and bring closure, which I am grateful for. Just knowing that, that person is not out there taking away some other sibling's life to me, there is comfort in that. The case was groundbreaking for Westminster Police. It not only was their oldest cold case, but also the first one they have solved. Westminster Chief Norm Halbert said, As someone who represents the organization for years, this case started in 1975. And to be able to close it today and represent all the men and women who have worked on this case is an enormous sense of pride and an enormous sense of accomplishment for the agency. And it is also a sense of relief that we were able to close this for the family. Unfortunately, Sherry's parents passed away before her perpetrator was identified. LVMPD Lieutenant Johansson said that the police were able to notify both of her adult sons and bring some closure to her family. He added that the department is backtracking data, 
to see if any additional cases may be connected to the same suspect. Gary Ridgway, also known as the Green River Perpetrator, was born on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City, Utah. The media gave him this nickname after his first five victims were found in the Green River in Utah. He was a longtime painter at a truck company. His parents were Mary Rita and Thomas Newton Ridgway, and he had two brothers, Gregory and Thomas Edward. He was married to Claudia Craig Barrows from 1970 to 1972, to Marsha Lorene Brown from 1973 to 1981, and Judith Lorraine Lynch from 1988 to 2002. He only had one son named Matthew. Ridgway was convicted of 49 separate cases that took place between 1982 to 1998, possibly as recent as 2001. This made him the second most prolific serial offender in United States history, according to confirmed cases. He had been a suspect in the cases since 1982, when he was arrested for prostitution. However, investigators were unable to link him at that time. Detectives were unable to prove his role until 2001, when advances in DNA technology allowed them to link a saliva sample they had obtained from him in 1987 to male DNA found on several victims. He was arrested on November 30, 2001, as he was leaving the Kenworth Truck Factory where he worked in Renton, Washington. Over 10,000 items of evidence collected and logged and stored were prepared to go to trial when Ridgway was arrested, according to Dave Reichert with the King County Sheriff's Office. At the time, investigators found he was not particularly accurate in associating dump sites with the victims that he placed there. To date, he has led the task force to the remains of three other victims, and he was incorrect about the identity of two of the three victims. In 2003, he pled guilty to 48 cases, and in 2011 to his 49th case. On December 18, 2003, he was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. As part of a plea bargain wherein he agreed to disclose the locations of still missing women, he was spared being executed. He is imprisoned at the Washington State Penitentiary, Walla Walla. Most of Ridgway's victims were alleged to be prostitutes and other women in vulnerable circumstances, including underage runaways. His victims were between the ages of 14 to 38. In one of his confessions, he said he chose prostitutes as victims because he knew they were unlikely to be missed. Patty Eeks, one of the prosecuting attorneys assigned to the case, said the lack of emotion Ridgway showed when he eventually admitted to taking the lives of the women was still troubling to her. She said Ridgway came across as just an average, goofy, middle-aged guy. Some victims may have been comfortable getting into his truck due to his seemingly harmless personality. I think he looked for vulnerable women. He had this strange, underlying need to feel like he had a beautiful woman by his side. Often, the women that he picked up were attractive. He wanted to be one of those guys who was like, I have a beautiful woman with me. He did not necessarily feel like he had that in his personal life. Physical attractiveness was definitely part of it, she said. Ridgway led investigators to the locations where he buried one of his victims by Green River. There, on August 21, 2003, 23 human bones and teeth were uncovered and listed only as Bones 20. After two decades, in 2023, 
Othram was able to identify the victim after examination of DNA extracted from the skeletal remains as Tammy Lyles. David Middleman, Othram's CEO, a molecular biophysicist and genetics expert, said the DNA was in very terrible shape, degraded. The company worked to build a new DNA profile based on the sample. Authorities contacted her mother, and using her reference sample, scientists were able to identify Tammy. Tammy's skull and other remains were found on April 23, 1985, at the Tualatin Golf Course near Tigrid, Oregon. It was identified in March 1988 using Tammy's dental records. In 2003, her brother, Jason Lyles, said that when her family buried her in the 1980s, they had to use a baby casket because we could not find all the parts of her body. You live with this for 20 years, wondering what happened. I cannot see myself ever finding closure, but I think it would settle a lot better if the guy would say, yeah, I did it. Tammy was a 16-year-old girl whose life was brought to an end in 1983. She stayed in Everett, Washington. She disappeared from downtown Seattle, Washington on June 9, 1983. In 2023, King County Sheriff Patricia Cole Tyndall said that Tammy's family does not want to speak to the media. We appreciate your support in granting the family the privacy they seek during this time, Cole Tyndall said. This breakthrough in the case comes after 15-year-old Lori Ann Respotnik was identified as another victim of Ridgeways. Lori was born on November 13, 1967, and stayed in Juneau, Alaska. She disappeared in 1982 after a fight with her mother. She wanted a horse. A friend had one. All Lori had to do, she told her mom, was pay for feed and pay rent for the stall. Donna Hurley, her mother, said no. She did not have the money. She did not have the time. Her husband had passed away a decade prior. She was a single mother raising two teenagers. It was not practical. Lori's disappearance would remain a mystery, an open wound, an aching phantom limb for more than four decades until her remains were identified as one of at least 49 victims. For 76-year-old Donna, Lori's disappearance, her absence, her demise have been an ever-present void for more than 40 years. I guess everybody calls it closure, but to me, it was just a relief, Donna said of Lori's identification. All of the what-ifs, how come, where has she been, all the questions that go through your mind, you quit trying to fool yourself that she is alive and well, raising a family and everything is good. It is just a relief that all of that is off your shoulders and off your mind. As a mother, part of me was still in denial. You build a wall around these things, she said. The tough thing is those walls start to crumble. Lori, she said, was a firecracker, interested in everything, sports, the outdoors, horses, dogs, and cooking. She played baseball and ran track. She liked a snowmobile. At seven, she trained the family Labrador retriever, Ebony's Flippy Miss, but known as Flip, and showed her in a dog show. She could get A's without opening her books, Donna said. She did speak with her daughter one time after she ran away. It was Thanksgiving, either 1982 or 83. Lori called her grandparents' home, where the family was gathered. She told them she would be sending Christmas presents. She said she was living in Seattle and she was happy. Lori's remains were discovered on December 30, 1985, about three years after she ran away from home and was marked as Bones 17. 
Parabon Nanolab's chief genetic genealogist, Cece Moore, did the genetic genealogy work. She works like a detective, using partial matches across many generations and multiple family trees to try to create a family tree, a lineage for the unknown person. She knew she was looking for a teenage girl, but Lori had left little trace. She was so young when she disappeared. She disappeared before social media, before online people searches, before the internet. She never voted, never bought property, never paid taxes. Moore scoured census records, birth announcements, yearbook photos. She came up empty. Then she stumbled upon an obituary. One paragraph on page 62 of the January 19, 1972 Seattle Times. Razpotnik, William S., of Juneau, Alaska, formerly of Seattle, husband of Donna, father of William George and Lori Ann. Donna she knew about. William George, Lori's brother, she knew about. She wrote a report and sent it to King County. And then, more than a year after Moore started searching, more than 40 years after Lori disappeared, two detectives showed up on Donna Hurley's doorstep. DNA was matched to a saliva sample from Donna to identify her. Donna had left Centralia, Pennsylvania and moved to Juneau, Alaska in the 1980s. Her parents lived there and the job prospects were better. She worked in the hotel business for a decade, at a veterinarian's office for 13 years, then for the Alaska Department of Education. Now retired, she has two grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. They are Lori's great and great-great nieces and nephews, although they have never met her. Lori's brother passed away in 2010 of cancer, just like her father. Over the years, Donna saw news coverage of the Green River perpetrator. She thought about it from time to time. We were in Alaska. We were so far removed, she said. I was still raising my son. I was trying to push all of it out of my mind. Law enforcement would post pictures and police sketches of victims. I never saw anyone that I felt looked like Lori, she said. Police posted a composite image of Bones 17, what they imagined she might look like based on DNA. Blondish hair, blue-green eyes, fair complexion. It took me a long time to admit it looked like her, Donna said. The composite image had straight hair, she thought to herself, but Lori had curly hair. A lot of it was denial. You become numb at a certain point. It is just, she paused, searching for words. It makes me sad that her life ended that way. Makes me angry at the person who did it. Makes me angry at myself that I could not stop it. And at a certain point, you just have to realize that you have another part of your family that you have to keep going forward for. Lori's idol, Donna said, was her dad. She does not think Lori ever got over his passing when she was only five. She was daddy's little girl. She had the curly ponytails and the big blue eyes. She plans to bury Lori at Evergreen Washelli Cemetery in Seattle, next to her dad. Dave Reichert with the King County Sheriff's Office said that although the last remains in the medical examiner's office have been identified, there are still more unsolved cases. Ridgway said that he ended the lives of 65 to 70 young women and little girls and so far, he has pled guilty to 49, and we have closed 51 cases. So as I said, there are other unsolved cases out there that may or may not be connected to Ridgeway. But there are parents still out there looking for answers about the whereabouts of their daughters. On April 21st, 2023, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee signed legislation removing execution from the state's law. 
According to the King County Prosecutor's Office, if Ridgway is convicted of additional slayings outside of Washington State, he still could face execution. Some think he was chasing a lost love. Others reckon he was a smuggler. Some say he was a Cold War spy. Sixty years later, an electronic engineer professor fell in love with not just this mystery, but a girl. A girl who held the key to what once seemed like the unsolvable mystery. We finally crack the puzzle after 70 years. This is the story of the Somerton Man. It is November 30th, 1948, about 7.15 p.m., and a couple is out for a leisurely walk along Somerton Park Beach, just outside Adelaide, South Australia. Waves are gently lapping, and that is when they spot a man in a sharp brown suit propped against the seawall. It looks like he is resting. He even gives them a half-hearted wave, but the couple just chuckle, thinking he has had one too many to drink. The next morning, two jockeys doing their usual routine training their horses on the beach see the same man, still as a statue, lying there on the sand. Now, that is strange, right? So Neil Day, one of the jockeys, walks over for a closer look. But when he tries to nudge the guy, nothing. And that is how the mystery of the Somerton Man began. Right there on the sunny shores of Adelaide back in December 1948. When authorities arrived on the scene, they transported the body to the Royal Adelaide Hospital for examination. The doctor in charge estimated that the man likely passed away around 2 a.m. that morning. At first glance, he appeared to be your average Joe, mid-40s, 5'11", with gray eyes and reddish-brown hair. He looked sharp, well put together with clean fingernails, soft hands, and a smooth-shaven face. However, upon closer inspection, a couple of irregularities caught the eye of one of the medical examiners. Firstly, the man had unusually pronounced calf muscles. Another peculiarity, a staggering 16 teeth were missing from his mouth. When they delved into the man's pockets, hoping to uncover some clues about his identity, they came up short. No wallet, no ID. All they found were a pack of cigarettes and matches, two combs, a packet of chewing gum, and a couple of travel tickets. An unused stub from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a nearby town, and a bus ticket stub from Adelaide to Somerton. But it was the man's clothing that really deepened the mystery. It was common back then for folks to have their names or initials on their clothes labels for laundry purposes. But all the labels from the man's suit had been snipped off, meticulously removed. Even the name tags from the undervest were also removed. And there was something else peculiar. A tear in his pant pocket had been neatly stitched back together using bright orange thread. The autopsy revealed some troubling findings, an enlarged spleen and a damaged liver. The pathologist suspected heart failure, but oddly enough, the man's heart appeared completely normal. Toxology tests came back negative. No poison found in his system. No signs of violence either, no disturbance in the sand around him, and no scratches on his body. The coroner was stumped. Whatever took the Somerton man's life, it was not natural. It sure was not an accident. Before the police could even begin to untangle who might have been behind the Somerton man's demise, they had to grapple with the question of who he was in the first place. His photo made its way into Australian newspapers, 
a silent plea for someone, anyone, to step forward and claim him as kin. Intrigued by the mystery, crowds flock to the morgue, hoping for a glimpse of his face. Time and again, individuals emerged from the shadows, swearing they knew the Somerton man, yet each lead fizzled into nothingness. Then came a twist. A newspaper boldly declared that the man found on Somerton Beach was none other than E.C. Johnson. But lo and behold, E.C. Johnson himself strolled into the police station, setting the record straight. Fingerprints were taken from the Somerton man, but unfortunately, no match was found. Still undeterred, the police circulated his photo far and wide. Dozens of calls flooded in, each claiming familiarity with the mysterious man. He was a missing relative, a vanished husband, a guardian outside illicit card games, a familiar face from the military testing facility up north. A local paper even quipped that the police were running an almost constant taxi service to ferry people to and from the morgue all eager for a glimpse of the enigmatic figure. But as quickly as hopes rose, they fell. People who were convinced they knew him changed their tune upon seeing him in the flesh. And so he remained the Somerton Man, a mystery that seemed to deepen with each passing day. Investigators would spend years, even decades, grappling with his identity and the events surrounding his demise. Theories swirled. He was a Cold War spy, a former dancer, a victim of a love gone sour. It became one of Australia's most perplexing and enduring cold cases, a tale that would captivate generations to come. About a month after stumbling upon his body, investigators shifted their focus to the Somerton man's meager possessions. Sure, he had those travel tickets and a few knickknacks, but no luggage to speak of. So the police cast their net wide, putting out notices for abandoned luggage at hotels and train stations. They scoured dry cleaners, bus stops, lost property offices, anywhere a bag might find itself abandoned. Then, like a stroke of luck, on January 14, 1949, just three days after the call went out, they struck gold. A dark brown suitcase left at the Adelaide train station caught their eye. According to the luggage tag, it had been checked in around 11 a.m. on November 30th the very same day the Somerton man was discovered on the beach. Upon prying it open, investigators found a curious mishmash of items. Handkerchiefs, scissors, a knife, shaving gear. But it was a humble spool of thread that set their minds racing. An unknown brand not found in Australia and in a shade of orange identical to the thread used to mend the Somerton man's pocket. Coincidence? Unlikely. But wait, there is more. Tucked amidst the odds and ends was a stencil brush, a tool typically wielded by a third officer in the Navy. Yet strangely, alongside this maritime clue, they unearthed drafting pencils, the kind favored by engineers. And then there were the clothes, shirts, underpants, a coat, all matching the Somerton man's size and style, all with their labels meticulously removed, except for three. Among them, a tie with a name scrawled on the label in faded ink. It looked like T. Keen. Finally, a glimmer of hope, the police had a potential lead, a possible name for the Somerton man. Records were combed through in English-speaking nations far and wide, including the United States, where the man's code originated from. 
Yet despite their efforts, no trace of a missing person by that name could be found anywhere. It seemed the man was determined to keep his identity hidden, leaving investigators grasping at straws in their quest for answers. Yet, with over six months having passed since his demise, it was time for the Somerton man to find his rest. But not before investigators preserved his one tangible clue, his face. They had him embalmed and crafted a plaster cast of his head and shoulders, a final homage to a man whose identity remained as elusive as ever. On June 14, 1949, the Somerton man was laid to rest in a cemetery in Adelaide. His identity remained elusive, buried beneath a concrete vault. The tombstone bore a simple inscription, Here lies the unknown man who was found at Somerton Beach. Despite the burial, authorities were no closer to unraveling the mystery that shrouded him in uncertainty. By April of 1949, the police found themselves at a standstill. Nearly five months had slipped by since the discovery of the body, and they were no closer to unraveling the mystery. Frustrated and desperate for a breakthrough, they turned to Professor John Cleland, a pathology expert at the University of Adelaide, to take a fresh look at the evidence. Professor Cleland's approach was nothing short of ingenious. Recognizing the challenge of determining if the clothes from the suitcase would fit the Somerton man's lifeless frame, he devised a clever solution. He enlisted someone of similar size to the Somerton man and had them try on both sets of clothes the ones the man was found in, and those from the suitcase. Miraculously, they fit like a glove, confirming without a shadow of a doubt that the suitcase did belong to him. But that was not all. While inspecting the Somerton man's garments, Professor Cleland stumbled upon a hidden pocket in the trousers. Inside lay a rolled up scrap of paper bearing just two words, Tamam Shud. Printed boldly, these Persian words stirred nothing in the professor's memory. The meaning behind this was quite puzzling, and nobody at the station understood what it meant. Then, a well-read newspaper reporter explained that it originated from a book by Omar Khayyam, the renowned 12th century poet, Specifically, they were from his book called Rubiat. The words Tamam Shud means the end. With this new insight, investigators speculated that the Somerton man had left behind this cryptic clue to signify he took his own life, or perhaps to ponder life's deeper meanings in his final hours. Interestingly, the Rubiat was widely cherished during that era. In 1909, two skilled English bookbinders were hired to rebind the first edition of the Rubiat, adorning it with over a thousand precious and semi-precious stones, including gold leaf, silver, and ivory. This exquisite edition was purchased by an American buyer for an equivalent of around $70,000 today. Unfortunately, that particular book met its fate on the Titanic, sinking during its voyage to America, and has remained lost ever since. But that is not the book the investigators were after. They wanted the very book the scroll was torn from. They contacted every library in the Adelaide area, seeking help from librarians to examine their copies of the Rubiat for any missing pages. If the scrap came from a unique printing, finding the exact book seemed like an insurmountable challenge, until a stroke of luck intervened. On July 24, 1949, a chemist walked into the Adelaide police station holding a copy of the Rubiat he had discovered in his car months earlier. 
around the time the Somerton man met his fate. Initially dismissing it, he became intrigued when the newspapers published the mysterious scrap. Turning to the final page, he revealed the missing words, Tamam Shud. The tear in the book perfectly matched the fragment from the Somerton man's pocket, providing a breakthrough authorities had been desperately seeking. Further examination of the book yielded another intriguing lead, a faintly penciled telephone number on the back cover. The telephone number belonged to a young nurse living near Somerton Beach, just a short stroll from where the man was discovered. And that is how Jessica Thompson became a person of interest. When police confronted Jessica, her reaction was as mysterious as the case itself. She denied any affiliation with the Somerton man. Investigators were essentially at a loss, and no further leads emerged. Then, they decided to bring her in to look at the cast of the Somerton man. She appeared visibly shaken at the sight of the plaster cast of the Somerton man's face. She oscillated between stunned silence and vague responses. The chief inspector noted her near collapse, extending a hand to steady her before realizing she could stand on her own. But her evasiveness only fueled the investigator's determination to peel back the layers of secrecy surrounding her. The puzzle of Jessica Thompson's phone number in the Somerton man's Rubiot weighed heavily on investigators. Pressed for answers, Jessica finally came clean. During World War II, she worked at a Sydney hospital where she crossed paths with an Australian army officer named Alfred Boxall. She was vague about their relationship, but she confessed to gifting him a copy of the Rubiot. Police thought they had a breakthrough, only to find out Boxall was alive and well and in possession of the Rubiot Jessica had given him. But this book was a different edition from the Somerton Man's. It bore Jessica's signature, along with a handwritten line of poetry. Returning to the mysterious pencil inscription, investigators uncovered more than just phone numbers. Below them lay a series of barely discernible letters. Under an ultraviolet light, the message became clearer five rows of seemingly random capital letters, with some crossed out. It dawned on them. It was a code. The Rubiot was forwarded to Australia's naval intelligence, renowned for deciphering wartime messages. Hoping for a breakthrough, police also reached out to the public by publishing the cryptic message in newspapers. Yet even the experts at naval intelligence struggled to crack the code. The code perplexed everyone, spawning theories from a ship's name to a message of despair. Despite collective efforts, no conclusive explanation emerged. In 1958, a decade after the Somerton man's discovery, police officially closed their investigation. However, the allure of an unsolved demise coupled with a mysterious code continued to fuel conspiracy theories. Like many unresolved mysteries, the Somerton case left a trail of unanswered questions and endless speculation, captivating the imaginations of those who dared to ponder its secrets. During the 1940s, Australia found itself deeply entangled in espionage, being part of the British Commonwealth and a crucial ally in the Allied forces during World War II. Intelligence agencies intercepted messages from enemy nations, playing a vital role in ending the conflict. Post-war, as the world divided along ideological lines of capitalism versus communism, the race for military technology supremacy intensified. Regarding the Somerton man, certain case details hinted that he might not be an ordinary citizen. He meticulously concealed his identity, with all clothing found on him and in the suitcase lacking labels. 
Only a few items bore the name Keen, which ultimately proved fruitless. His nationality remained a puzzle. While some speculated he was British based on his facial features and hairstyle, others suggested American ties due to the origin of his coat. Yet the presence of an American-made coat did not definitively brand him a spy. It is plausible that the Somerton man had visited America for leisure or family reasons before his mysterious demise. But that was not the only clue pointing to a foreign identity. There was also the peculiar orange thread used to mend his pants, a brand not sold in Australia. This suggested extensive travel, painting the Somerton man as an international enigma. The question then arose, what was he doing in Adelaide, a remote city along Australia's southern coast? The answer might lie about 300 kilometers north at the Woomera Air Force Complex. Woomera, a joint base between Australia and the United Kingdom, boasted the largest land-based test range in the Western world. Established in 1947, it covered a sprawling 47,000 square miles of flat, arid land, roughly the size of Pennsylvania. The base housed highly secretive facilities, conducting some of Britain's most sensitive military projects, including missile, rocket, and atomic bomb testing. If this speculation holds true, South Australia would likely have been a hotbed for espionage activity. It is conceivable that the Somerton man was an Australian spy who knew too much. Perhaps he became loyal to the Soviets and needed to be silenced. Alternatively, he could have been a Soviet operative seeking defection, but met his demise before he could act. This brings us back to the mysterious circumstances of his end. During the investigation, medical experts found no trace of poison in the man's system, at least none detectable by conventional means. One explanation was that he ingested or was administered something that instantly decomposed, leaving no evidence. Another theory suggested injection, yet no signs of puncture wounds were found. The condition of his liver did not support this notion. Seeking answers, the coroner consulted Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks, a professor of physiology and pharmacology at the University of Adelaide. Hicks scribbled down the names of suspected poisons on a piece of paper for the coroner. Among them was strophanthin, a potent substance historically used by some West African tribes to create poison arrows. Fatal, even in small doses, it was undetectable by standard chemical tests. In 2013, Jessica Thompson's daughter Kate disclosed that her mother had a command of the Russian language, a detail Jessica had never shared with anyone. Furthermore, Jessica confessed to Kate that she had misled the police regarding the identity of the Somerton man. Jessica hinted that the matter extended beyond the jurisdiction of the police, suggesting involvement in a higher echelon. This revelation sparked speculation that Jessica might have been engaged in counter-espionage activities for the Australian government. She was possibly relaying intelligence to military authorities, with the Rubiot serving as a crucial component. However, if even the most adept codebreakers were unable to decipher the cryptic message, the question remained, who possessed the key? Derek Abbott first encountered the Somerton Man's story in a magazine article back in 1995. Despite his initial intrigue, his professional obligations as an electrical engineering professor at Adelaide University prevented him from delving deeper into the mystery. It was not until 2007 when Derek revisited the story 
and learned of the unsolved code found in the man's possession that his interest was reignited. Despite six years of investigation by code-breaking experts, the puzzle remained unsolved. Undeterred, Derek shifted his focus to unraveling a different enigma, the identity of Jessica. For decades, the true identity of the enigmatic nurse remained shrouded in secrecy, a real name redacted from official records to shield her from public attention. Derek enlisted the help of Jerry Feltus, an Adelaide detective, who provided the original piece of paper bearing Jessica's phone number found in the Somerton man's book. Through meticulous investigation, Derek unveiled Jessica's true identity, Jessica Thompson, known as Joe. Unfortunately, Jessica had passed away before Derek could question her about her connection to the Somerton man. Delving into Jessica's history, Derek discovered that she had been romantically involved with a local man named Prosper Thompson, with whom she had a son named Robin in 1947, a year and a half before the Somerton man's demise. Despite Jessica's claims that Prosper was Robin's father, speculation arose regarding the paternity of her child, particularly given her evasiveness during police questioning. This led Derek to a groundbreaking theory. The Somerton man was Robin's biological father. Upon further investigation, Derek unearthed compelling evidence supporting his theory. Robin, like the Somerton man, exhibited unique physical traits, including a genetic disorder called hypodontia and distinctive ear structures. Moreover, both had backgrounds in ballet, with Robin even having performed with the Australian Ballet Company. These findings suggested a familial connection between Robin and the Somerton man. It was further supported by the discovery of Robin's daughter, Rachel Egan, potentially being the Somerton man's granddaughter. Rachel's journey into her family's past, intertwined with one of Australia's greatest enigmas, was nothing short of remarkable. As she delved deeper into her ancestry, she uncovered layers of mystery that connected her to the unknown man found on Somerton Beach. Despite initial skepticism, Rachel agreed to a meeting with Derek Abbott. Their shared curiosity and determination led to an unexpected bond, a spark that eventually blossomed into a love story that surpassed even the most enduring mysteries. Derek and Rachel got married in 2010 and have three children together. The most sensible approach was to exhume the remains of the Somerton man to extract DNA. Derek made several requests, but each time the request was denied to exhume the remains. However, in 2015, Derek found another way. He discovered some of the Somerton man's hair still embedded in the plaster cast made in the 1940s. Derek sent these hairs to a laboratory at the University of Adelaide. He hoped there was enough genetic material to test against Rachel's DNA. Unfortunately, the results were inconclusive, and scientists could not generate a complete DNA sequence from the limited sample. But in 2021, Derek's hope was reignited when the Australian government finally exhumed the Somerton man. On May 18, 2021, a team with heavy machinery arrived at Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery. It took nearly 12 hours to extract the Somerton man from the ground. Being deceased for over 70 years meant most of his organic matter had deteriorated, and on top of that, he had been embalmed. This involves replacing the body's natural fluids with preservatives. While this preservation technique was beneficial for maintaining the body's condition, it also degraded the DNA. 
there was a possibility that there might not be enough viable DNA left to obtain a sample. In 2022, Derek collaborated with Colleen Fitzpatrick, and they meticulously traced the genetic breadcrumbs left behind by the Somerton man, the hair on the plaster cast. As they pieced together his family tree, one name stood out. A man fitting the Somerton man's description with a brother-in-law named Thomas Keene matched the name found on the mysterious clothing. Derek and Colleen located nieces and nephews of the Somerton man. They gathered DNA samples from their living descendants, and on July 22, 2022, they found two matches. Stuart Webb, Somerton man's great-great-nephew, and Christy Webb, his grandniece. The discovery sent shockwaves through the investigative community. It reignited hope that the identity of the Somerton man was on the verge of being unveiled. His name was Carl Charles Webb, an electrical engineer born in Melbourne, Australia in November 1905. As the details of Webb's life unraveled, it became apparent that his story was far from ordinary. He was part of a large family with six siblings. Newspaper reports from that time indicated that he participated in community football. This could account for his well-developed calves and overall physique. Leading up to his demise, Charles experienced major loss in life. His father and mother passed away, along with his brother Roy, with whom he shared a close bond. Additionally, Charles also went through a separation with his wife, Dorothy Robertson, whom he married around 1941. Their marriage was difficult, as detailed in Dorothy's divorce decree filed later. Charles had a passion for writing poetry, often centered around the theme of fatality. Once, Dorothy found him drenched in ether in bed. He ingested 50 sleeping pills, but she saved his life. Contrary to wild speculation, Charles's story unveils a tale of domestic tragedy rather than espionage intrigue. In April 1947, Webb vanished without a trace, leaving behind a shattered family and a cloud of mystery. While DNA evidence pointed strongly to Webb's identity, the South Australia Police Department continued its own testing to verify the identification. However, the lack of official confirmation left room for speculation, keeping the door open to conspiracy theories that had long surrounded the case. Despite the lingering uncertainties, Derek Abbott found closure in his own quest DNA testing ruled out any relation between his wife, Rachel, and the Somerton man. This alleviated the personal burden he had carried for years. For the Webb family, the revelation brought a mix of emotions, relief, closure, and a sense of reclaiming a lost piece of their history. Stuart and Christy Webb, great-great-nephew and grandniece of Charles Webb, delved into old family albums. They rediscovered photos of Charles that had long been forgotten. Back then, there was a big family gathering involving all members of the Webb family. This photo was basically taken 20 years before he lost his life. Through their journey, Charles Webb transformed from a mysterious figure in headlines to a cherished member of their family. He is a person whose story resonated far beyond the confines of a cold case, but as a testament to the enduring power of familial bonds. A large part of the Somerton Man case has been solved. We now know his identity, but unfortunately, a lot of answers went to the grave with him. We might never know the circumstances that led to his demise. It was December 23, 1987. 
20-year-old Janet Brachu was enjoying an evening out with friends when her night was cut short. While everyone else was allowed into the T. Woody's bar, Janet was just shy of the legal drinking age. She was asked to leave. A man she had met earlier that evening offered to drive her home. She then got sick in the parking lot and he refused to allow her into his car. Exactly what happened next to Janet was a mystery for over three decades before the person who took her life that brisk December evening was finally revealed. And shockingly, it was not only Janet's demise he was responsible for. Janet Brachu grew up in Winslow, a small main town situated along the Kennebec River. Back in the 1980s, Winslow had a modest population of around 8,000 residents. It was a quiet town and a good place to raise children. Janet's parents, Geraldine and Albert Brachu, adopted her as a young child and raised her into a bright, happy young adult while helping her to manage her diabetes. She needed regular insulin, but Janet was responsible when it came to the important things. Her early dealings with her own medical care may have even been what inspired her to get into the field. As of late 1987, she was working as a dietary assistant at Maine General Medical Center's Seton campus. But on that December evening, work was the last thing on Janet's mind. It was their holiday break from college and the perfect time to be catching up with old friends from high school. Janet did not often get to see them. Their first stop was a local bowling alley in the town of Waterville, less than a mile away from Winslow. While the friends took their turn sending the ball down the lane, they struck up a conversation with two men in the next alley over. They got on well enough to want to continue the evening together. And once everyone was finished, they set off to T. Woody's restaurant and bar. The bar was found on the lower level of Waterville's concourse with a great view of the river. When they arrived, Janet was turned away. Maine's drinking age had been raised to 21 only two years prior. Janet now just missed the mark. Her friends were all of legal age and they wanted to keep the night going. Janet, being the odd one out, needed to find a ride home, and it just so happened that one of the men they had met at the bowling alley was happy to oblige. The details of what followed are loose, but there are a few facts we do know. Janet had forgotten her purse inside T. Woody's, and the man who was supposed to be driving her home went back inside to retrieve it, possibly because Janet was not allowed back in. When he returned to the parking lot, Janet was throwing up. It could either be because she had been drinking earlier in the night or from some other reason, like her diabetes. She could also have possibly eaten something that did not agree with her. The man who was supposed to take her home then refused to allow her into his car, not wanting her to be sick inside it. Then she was gone. Janet's parents woke up the next morning to find she was not home. After calling around to see if she had stayed at any of her friends' houses and having no luck tracking her down, Geraldine and Albert reported her missing. An extensive search was launched and Janet's disappearance appeared on news stations across the country. The investigators tasked with finding out what happened to Janet turned over every stone. They followed up on each lead presented to them, no matter where in the country it came from. They even tried to use the fact that Janet was diabetic to find her. They looked into insulin sales that could possibly be tied to Janet. Unfortunately, no matter what they tried, they never seemed to get past square one. And soon the days turned into weeks, and still Janet was nowhere to be seen. It truly was as if she had vanished into thin air. Janet's family tried to hold on to the hope that she would be brought home alive. Each agonizing day since her disappearance, they prayed a call would come through from the police department with good news. Those hopes were crushed less than three months later. A call finally came, 
but it was the one no parent ever wants to receive. In the early morning hours of March 18, 1988, a man called Christopher Anthony was checking on his hydropower station at Waverly Avenue Dam. He then made a terrible discovery. Floating in the Sebastocook River was an unclothed body. Christopher notified the authorities who were soon on the scene. That section of the river was cordoned off. A cursory search was conducted along the river's edge to see if any items of interest had been left behind. The body was taken to the coroner's office to be examined and identified. There, they discovered it belonged to Janet Brachu. The initial examination did not reveal what had caused Janet's passing. It was, however, determined that Janet had not been alive for long after she was last seen at T. Woody's. In the weeks following the discovery, a specialized dive team was set up on the Sebastocook River. They were trying to find any of Janet's personal items or evidence that could point to what happened to her in the hours after she was last seen. The investigators could not yet rule out the possibility that Janet had fallen in the river herself that night. The Kennebec and the Sebastocook rivers meet not too far down from T. Woody's. It was cold and dark when she was left in the parking lot. Maybe Janet tried to walk home and accidentally slipped into the frigid waters while crossing the bridge leading back to Winslow, unable to get herself out before succumbing to hypothermia. But there was one serious problem with this theory, the lack of clothes on her body when she was found. It was highly unlikely that the water's current could have stripped Janet entirely of everything she had on that night. And even more importantly, Janet's body was found upstream of the river. This meant it would not have been possible for her to have fallen in while walking home and ending up where she was found. But if Janet did not fall into the river, who had put her there? As the mystery continued, folks in Maine began wondering whether a serial perpetrator was on the loose. It was an avenue the investigators had begun looking into as well. An hour away in the town of Jay in Maine, 17-year-old Kimberly Moreau vanished on May 9, 1986. She was last seen with someone she had met earlier that same day. Despite a diligent search across the state, the police were unable to find out what had happened to her. No connection could be drawn from Kimberly to Janet's case. Unbeknownst to the investigators, another woman would go missing just five months after Janet's body was found. And her case had far more similarities to that of Janet's. On August 9, 1988, 23-year-old Geraldine Finn was letting her hair down after work with two co-workers. She was employed at the Skohegan Nursing Home as a certified nursing assistant. The bar, called Pete and Larry's, was in Waterville's Upper Main Street. It just so happened to be no more than three miles from T. Woody's, where Janet was last seen. While Geraldine and her co-workers were sitting by the window, a stranger drove past in his blue Chevy Blazer. He caught their attention and began gesturing for the three young women to go outside. They did just that and began walking to his car. He then asked if they wanted to go for a swim. However, this was not exactly an innocent request. By the time they were at his rolled-down window, the women found he was completely nude. He requested that they go skinny dipping with him. Likely weirded out by the interaction, they turned around and went back to the bar to continue their evening. It was not even 8.30 p.m. yet, and the group still wanted to spend some time out before heading home. Some time went by before that same man arrived at the bar, this time fully clothed. As the evening progressed, he started to speak to Geraldine's group. Maybe he offered up some sort of excuse for the earlier interaction. He was possibly blaming it on the fact that he had already been out skinny dipping and his clothes were wet. Whatever he said, it was enough for Geraldine's group to start interacting with him. 
by the end of the night, Geraldine felt comfortable around the man, so much so that she accepted his offer for a ride home. The last time those friends saw Geraldine, she was sitting in the passenger seat of his Chevy. Little did they know they would never see their friend alive again. She was reported missing the following day. Her friends told the authorities about the man who was supposed to take her home that previous evening. They mentioned his blue Chevy blazer, distinctive mustache, and diamond-shaped tattoo on his shoulder. On August 14, 1988, five days after Geraldine went missing, a man walking across the property along Route 201 made a terrible discovery. In a wooded area along the field he had been surveying was the body of a young woman. Initially, the authorities remained tight-lipped about the nature of what they were investigating. However, two days later, they announced that it was the body of Geraldine Finn. They noticed it was not an accidental fatality. Someone took her life. Now, the main focus was on finding the man she had last been seen with. Soon enough, they would find out who he was. A 29-year-old man named Gerald Goodell. Gerald Goodell worked various construction jobs in Waterville. When his name was brought up in relation to Geraldine Finn's case, those who knew him personally seemed to act surprised at the news. A family friend said Goodell had always been helpful, happy to jump in where he could to assist in any way possible. Goodell's father also reacted to the news, saying that nothing was adding up. His son could not have done anything to hurt Geraldine. He claimed his son had an alibi for that night. Goodell's father said that he had been at home until 9.15, waiting for a phone call. After that, he went out mud running. Obviously, the investigators took what his father was saying with a pinch of salt. They were not going to take a family member's word for it. Especially not when the co-workers who were with Geraldine that night said Goodell looked just like the man who was last seen with her. After placing Goodell under police surveillance, the authorities moved to arrest him on August 15th. He was taken into custody and charged with taking Geraldine Finn's life. When the news broke, reporters began pointing to possible connections between Janet and Geraldine's cases. Both young women were a similar age. They worked in the medical industry, and they were each last seen after a night out with friends in Waterville. Each of them were last seen in the parking lots of two bars, which were just three miles from each other. The locations where their bodies were found also shared some similarities. Even though Janet was found in the water, the surrounding area was rural and remote. The same had been the case with the location of Geraldine's body. But there was something even more concerning. Goodell had admitted to a family member that he saw Janet Brachu in the parking lot of T. Woody's on the night she was last seen. That directly tied him to the case, considering Goodell had not ever come forward to the authorities with this information, despite their frequent appeals. On September 3rd, Goodell appeared in court for his bail hearing. The state put forward their case that he was a danger to society and should remain in custody until his trial the following year. To prove their point, the state brought several witnesses to the stand. They revealed that Goodell had been questioned in relation to Janet's case in the weeks following her disappearance. They successfully proved their case and Goodell was taken back to jail awaiting his May 1989 trial. When it rolled around, the prosecution was confident they would get a conviction. They had witness evidence stating Goodell was the last person seen with Geraldine and highlighted his concerning behavior earlier that evening. However, they did not even need to prove he was responsible. Goodell admitted to the crime. But he did so while asking for a lesser sentence. He stated that what he did had not been premeditated. 
Goodale claimed he had taken Geraldine's life in a panic after she ran to get away from him. The prosecution, though, were not interested in giving him a lesser sentence. They felt he was a serious danger and needed to be put behind bars for as long as possible. After a judge found him guilty of the charges, Goodale still had one card up his sleeve to try and reduce the amount of time he would have to spend behind bars. He told investigators that he knew something about Janet Brachu's case, the most important fact of all. He claimed he knew who the perpetrator was. But Goodale was not exactly cooperative. Strangely enough, even after this, Goodell was still never publicly named as a suspect in the case. At his sentencing, Goodell was given 75 years behind bars, with the earliest possible release being in 2033. And then the years began to pass. Soon, Janet's family were welcoming the new millennium with still no news of her case. Three decades had passed before there was an update. In 2019, on the 32nd anniversary of Janet's disappearance, it was announced that a cold case team would begin looking into Janet's demise again. Her mother and father were no longer alive to hear this positive news, but other family members and old friends now had a renewed hope that whoever took Janet's life would be brought to justice. Even after all those years, and then, on May 14th, 2021, the day everyone had been waiting for, an arrest had been made of a prisoner at Maine State Penitentiary. It was none other than Gerald Goodell. But what had led to this update in a case that had seen no movement for so long? As some of you may have guessed already, it was DNA. State Police Chief John Cote commented on the news, saying, This case represents years of combined work by state, local, and county investigators, prosecutors, and skilled scientists who never relented in their pursuit of the truth and for justice for this victim, her family, and friends. In March 2023, Goodell, now in his early 60s, was given an additional 32.5 years to his sentence for what he did to Janet Brachu. Seeing the writing on the wall, Goodell did not try to deny his involvement and instead pleaded guilty to the charges laid against him. Though her parents could not be in the courtroom that day, other family members gathered to finally get justice for the life taken so young. Her cousin, Daniel Brachu said, She was a sweet girl, young, foolish, like the rest of us. It may come as a small consolation to Janet's family that the perpetrator responsible had not been out living his life all those years. He had been serving time, even though it was not for her case. As for exactly what happened that night, the details have not been publicly released. Undoubtedly, there will be some secrets Gerald Goodell will take with him to the grave. The last time Mary McLaughlin's daughter saw her alive, she was strolling down the street to her apartment after a fun evening of dominoes. Nothing seemed amiss. She had not a thought in her mind that she would not see her mother again soon. However, that is not what happened. For three and a half decades, the case of Mary McLaughlin's slaying went unsolved, until the police finally had a name. But even then, there was a problem. How could the perpetrator be the person they were looking for when he was serving a prison sentence at the time? On September 26, 1984, 58-year-old Mary McLaughlin was spending the evening at her local pub in Glasgow, Scotland. She was playing dominoes with one of her daughters. Mary had a large extended family and was deeply loved by them all. She was a mother to 11 children and grandmother to 26 grandchildren. Once they had wrapped their evening up, Mary's daughter Catherine walked off to the bus stop and rode home. 
While walking back to her own apartment, Mary made a brief stop at the corner shop. She picked up a pack of cigarettes before continuing on her way. We know she made it home that night, but unbeknownst to her, she was not alone. Six days later, Mary's son Martin arrived for his weekly visit to find the door was locked. He knocked a few times, but his mother was not answering. Concern mounting, Martin tried to get a spare key from her homeowner. When he discovered this was not possible, Martin felt his only choice was to break down the door. As it swung open, he was greeted by a foul odor. Mary was lying in her bed, but it was clear she had passed days ago. Her dressing gown was on backwards, and her dentures were lying on the floor beside her. The cause was clear. The rope from her dressing gown had been wrapped tightly around her neck and was double-knotted. Further examination determined that Mary's life was taken on the evening she returned home from the pub. Martin, seeing his mother in that way, is something he will never forget. Commenting on it, Martin said, It frightened the life out of me and has tortured me ever since. A forensic examination revealed that the perpetrator had left DNA behind. However, back then, the technology had not advanced enough to test such a minute sample. Luckily, the samples were kept safe until the time came, and a long time it was. Other than the confirmed sighting of Mary when she was purchasing her cigarettes, there was another person who came forward to tell the authorities what they had seen. Mary was spotted walking down the street past the shop, barefoot, holding her shoes in her hand. It was likely to ease her aching feet from a day of wearing heeled shoes. The police were desperate for someone to come forward with information that could help them solve the case. They took in hundreds of statements and followed up on all available leads, but yet they got nowhere. The man who last saw her caring for her shoes made some mention of a man following her. When later asked about it at trial, he said, well, yes, every time Mary walked away, he was always behind her. The authorities believed there was a predator out roaming Glasgow who could strike again at any moment. All they could do at the time was ensure the evidence collected that day was stored safely away, until the time came when it could possibly solve this case. It was not until 2008, 24 years later, that those DNA samples were tested again. Unfortunately, the forensic examiners were still unable to get an adequate profile of the perpetrator. Once again, the evidence was tucked away. Then, in 2014, a new DNA profiling facility was opened at the Scottish Crime Campus. This meant that instead of the previous 11 identification markers obtainable from a DNA sample, the scientists utilizing this new technology could identify 24 markers. But what did this really mean? Now, samples that were previously too small to get any real conclusive testing done on could be profiled with a far greater accuracy. In 2019, the evidence from the Mary McLaughlin case was sent to the laboratory in the hopes that this new round of testing would reveal the perpetrator's identity. In particular, they focused in on her dressing gown cord, the item that had been used to take her life. Unraveling the cord and cautiously undoing one of the knots that remained, they swabbed that untouched surface. For 35 years, that part of the fabric had been left undisturbed. This offered the scientists the best chance at obtaining a strong profile. Step one was a success. The team was able to gather a strong DNA profile to run against the Scottish database. When they did so, the match came back rapidly. They knew who was responsible for taking Mary McLaughlin's life that night. 59-year-old Graham McGill, a man who was no stranger to the authorities. Now that they had a name, 
investigators could start looking into McGill. Before long, they uncovered a curious piece of information. McGill was imprisoned at the time of the incident. But how could that be? It turned out that while he was technically serving a prison sentence at that time on September 26, the night Mary was targeted, he was out on temporary release. Temporary releases are allowed for a few reasons, mainly for approved prisoners to get affairs in order for their release, like job interviews or finding housing. Family matters can also apply. That night, McGill was out on an unsupervised release when he spotted Mary walking home, and we know what happened next. McGill had not been a suspect or person of interest in the 1984 investigation. His name had not even come up once. Once the investigators had gotten back the confirmed DNA results, they spent a few months going over the old casework. They had to make sure they had enough evidence, in addition to the DNA results, to put McGill behind bars for what he did to Mary. Then, on December 4, 2019, Graham McGill was arrested and charged in connection with the slaying of Mary McLaughlin. When McGill was taken to trial, one of the witnesses called to the stand was his ex-wife. She told the jury that in 1988, McGill had confessed to taking a woman's life. He told her details of the crime that fit the details of Mary's case. But he threatened that if she told anyone or tried to go to the police, he would take her life as well. When she asked him why he had done it, McGill told his then-wife that he wanted to know what it would feel like. In April 2021, McGill was found guilty and subsequently sentenced to a minimum of 14 years behind bars. He will be in his mid-70s by the time he is even considered for release. Reacting to the jury's verdict, Martin, the son that found Mary's body, commented, There is no joy at the verdict, but there is justice, and my mom can finally rest in peace. It has been years of torture for everyone in the family, and there is a sense of relief. He is a revolting individual, and it brings some comfort to think that he will never again see anywhere other than the inside of a prison. He also revealed the moment he found out about the McGill arrest. Two police officers came to my door on December 4th, 2019, and said they had arrested someone and he was due in court the next day. That was it. To receive that news after 35 years was an incredible moment. I had always hoped it would happen, but doubted it actually would. I was totally shocked and just broke down. Over three decades later, Mary McLaughlin finally got justice. Her family can now sleep a little bit easier at night, knowing the monster that took her life is locked behind bars where he belongs.